Okay, welcome to the first uh, Pulse seminar of the quarter. It's my pleasure to introduce Eva Darulova, who's coming from NPI for software systems. She got her PhD at EPFL, and uh, she works in static verification of programs with floating points, an area where many people entered and didn't leave the field alive. <laughs> but she's still walking and smiling. I'm very happy to have her here. Thank you, Eva. Thank you very much for the introduction. So as Raz said, I did my PhD at EPFL, and most of the work I'm presenting here I did at that time, so that's where the logo comes from. The other one is from the MPI for Software Systems. We'll soon have a new one, but I didn't find a picture that would not overlap with the other picture. So the title is Programming with Numerical Uncertainty, so now I'll first try to explain what I actually mean by that. So programming for me, or in this talk at least, is uh, suppose we want to implement a function like this. So in this case, this is a tile approximation of a sign. And we actually don't worry about the approximation error due to the Tyler expression. So we just have an arithmetic expression. This is something you would write on paper. But if you actually want to implement that, you have to select the data type. So that's where you have the three question marks. Now, there the question, the first question comes up. So which data type do you choose? There are actually many options. So you could go with like standard floating point arithmetic, just single precision or double precision. Perhaps this is not good enough for you, so you would go to software and choose double or quadruple that. Or perhaps you have an embedded system, so you would like to do without the floating point unit completely, so you may choose fixed point arithmetic here. Now, one aspect you may care about is the performance, so that's the bigger gray bars. As you see, they go up quickly when you have to go to software. But the runtime is probably not the only thing you care about. You may also care about the actual errors that you get, get the round of errors from the finite precision arithmetic. Now, they're usually roughly inversely, inversely proportional to the runtime. So essentially, you have a trade-off between accuracy and performance. And the goal of my work was really try to help a programmer navigate this trade-off by being able to compute these absolute errors, which are in general hard to guess just by looking at that and the application. So really, the programming is implementing a real-valued uh, arithmetic function. And we care about numerical uncertainties, such as round of errors or input errors that may come from noisy sensors. And we want to do this correctly, so actually have sound guarantees on the, on the round of errors. And another uh, motivation comes from the field called approximate computing, where you deliberately try to lower the precision as low as possible in order to really speed up the, the program. So quick outline of my talk. I'll first present a new programming model. Then I'll go into some technical details of how we actually compute uh, and bounce these uh, numerical errors. And then in the end, I'll briefly talk about how we even try to improve accuracy. So first. We lower the accuracy by choosing small data types, and then we also try to improve it. OK, so instead of actually writing floating point computations, we suggest that we actually should write programs over real data types. So with real here, this is obviously not executable. You can't compute with reals. Um, and this is also not enough. So we also ask the programmer to give us input ranges uh, on all the inputs. Additionally, the programmer may also specify input errors. So this could be the noise that you may have in your sensors. And then the maximum absolute error that you are willing to tolerate um, on the result. Now, the reason why we want to use this specification language, because this is actually what you would really, what you have in mind when you're writing this down on a piece of paper. You don't really think in floating points or fixed point arithmetic. This is also perhaps the code that you have proven something about, because it's in general easier to reason about real arithmetic than floating points. It also gives us an explicit baseline against which we want to compute the errors. So it's not just implicit in your code when you write uh, floating points. And in the future, it may allow um, sound compiler optimizations. So you may know floating point arithmetic is not associative. So the compile compiler is not actually allowed to, to change the order of the computation. However, if you have a real arithmetic specification, then we can change it as long as the specification 
so the post condition is satisfied. So and then once you write this kind of spec, then you can feed it into the tool I've developed that we called Rosa, which is sort of a verifying source-to-source -source compiler. It's going to take that, determine which kind of data type satisfies the specification, and will generate the code for you. So for floating points, so these are the data types we support right now, the code generation essentially amounts to just replacing the real uh, string with uh, float, double, 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 and so on. For fixed point arithmetic, you have to do a little bit more work, and this actually falls out of our analysis automatically. So is everyone familiar with fixed point arithmetic? No. No? So it's sort of like floating points, except that you have to encode some of the work that the floating point unit does dynamically in code. So that's essentially here these bit, uh, uh, bit shifts. So what you need to synthesize on your own that the floating point unit would do for you is the amount of shifts that you need. And for this to work, you need to know the ranges of the values as well. Um, the advantage is that you can implement this then in, with processor with just interval arithmetic and you don't, don't need a specific hardware unit for that. And if you want to, you can try it out. It's a prototype, um, but it should work. At least people tell me it does work. OK, so obviously the biggest part of this uh, verifying compiler is the quantification of these numerical errors. And we're also not the uh, first ones doing this. Numerical programs have been around since the first computers have been around. So I want to just put this into context. So you can quantify errors if you're a numerical analysis, something like this. Um, however, your analysis is going to be manual, and you essentially have to be an expert. And mostly, well, all you can hope for are asymptotic error bounds. So if you really want very tight and accurate bounds, this may not actually work. If you are into interactive theorem proving, you can even prove these bounds in a prover. But again, this is at least partially manual. And now you have to be an expert in both theorem proving and the numerical analysis part. You can do testing, which is much simpler in a sense, but it won't give you any strong guarantees on the error bounds that you can get. So what we are aiming for is a static analysis that is fully automated, that gives you guarantees, and that gives you reasonable accuracy. So you could, you could always say, OK, the errors are between minus infinity and infinity, which is going to be sound and fully automated, but fairly useless. So we try to find really how close we can get it um, to the true errors. And please feel free to just ask questions anytime. OK, so we want to quantify numerical errors statically, soundly, accurately, and automatically. Now, as you can see from the list, it's probably not as simple as it sounds. So let's start with just loop-free and branch-free code. So we're interested in finding the absolute error bound, not relative errors. We don't know yet how to do that. It's actually even more complicated. So for the worst case error, we need to bound the round of errors that happen at every operation. And we need to propagate these round of errors through the rest of the computation as it happens. Now, it turns out that both of these actually depend on the ranges of values that you see in your computation. So we need to bound those two. So in effect, what the analysis does is a simple data flow analysis. You, at every step in your abstract syntax tree, you first compute the real valued ranges for your intermediate value. With these ranges, you can propagate the, the errors that you have already accumulated. And you can compute the new error that you will attach to it. So this is the basic structure. So let's start with the first one. We need to compute the real valued ranges. How do we do that? So we could start with simple interval arithmetic. So you just have upper and lower runs for all inputs. Now, the problem becomes evident when you try to do x minus x, which does not actually give you 0, but something that's twice the width. And this can become problematic if you have more operations. So sort of improvement over that uh, is uh, a fine arithmetic that can track at least the linear correlations. So when you actually do the x minus x, because you now have a middle value x0, and then sort of the, the noise terms here will have a sign so that they can actually cancel. 
and you can actually get a zero out of it. So you can track linear correlations, but if you have nonlinear operations, then you still need to do approximations, which, depending on circumstances, may become bigger. So we actually found this out when we tried to analyze this jet engine benchmark, uh, which is an embedded controller. <coughs> this was, I think, mostly generate, generated uh, in MATLAB, and the ranges also came from the uh, embedded domain. Now, if you try to propagate that with interval arithmetic, then for the value T2, you get a range that includes zero. And as you see later on, we're actually dividing by this value. So we're just going to get a range of minus infinity to infinity. However, this is actually a spurious division by zero. It doesn't actually happen in reality. Another problem comes in when we try to compute the area of a triangle with the standard textbook formula. However, this formula only holds when you have a true triangle, so when two sides are bigger than the third. So that's this constraint here. But this also cannot really be captured in interval arithmetic, because you really want to, requires you to track correlations. So since we can't do that, then we actually end up trying to take the square root of a negative number, which again is not going to work. And we ran into very similar issues with the fine arithmetic as well, because these are nonlinear computations. Yes. So how do they deal with that in the current benchmark? Are they, you know, programs that use these? I mean, do they just make an error? Uh, for which benchmarks? It's like I mean, you're saying like these were actually came from like an embedded system and like you know, someone Yeah, but they were trying to do something else with them. So they they were used for um, control system analysis, not the kind of round of error analysis that we do. So I suspect they never wanted, never had to check, or maybe they did some. So there are some other techniques you can use to get around this problem. But what about the time for area? Um, I thought it was pretty bad if you ended up thinking of it. I guess no one actually tried to analyze this auto fully automatically. So what you can do is just narrow down the ranges so that you're always guaranteed to have a true triangle. But then if you want to do the analysis for several ones, then you have to just repeat the analysis for many. Okay, so really the, the problem here was the nonlinearity and the correlations. So our solution, after trying various different things, trying to retrofit a fine arithmetic with various stuff and failing miserably in all of them, we tried something very simple in the end. So we stick with simple interval arithmetic, we get an initial estimate, and then try to refine it using an SMT solver. So the way it works, we get an initial interval, we take a smaller one and ask the solver, is this still sound? And we do a binary search until we find one that is small enough. We have some termination criteria. So why this works and why this is good is because the NLSAT solver in Z3 that we use has a full decision procedure for real arithmetic that can take into uh, account all the correlations between variables and also these additional constraints as we had before. Obviously, the solver may fail at some point, in our case it may just time out, but we can just go back to the sound but maybe inaccurate interval arithmetic um, that we had before. And these, with, these, um, uh, with this range computation we then can also do runtime error checks for overflow, division by zero and so on. I mean that just falls out uh, of this. So just some graph that this actually works. So here I compare intervals we have computed for the result of some of the benchmarks, and we compare that against a simulated range. So we have obtained this under approximation of the true range with some million or 10 million inputs, and this is normalized to one. So we want to be close to one, and the red bars are actually very close to one, so that's the uh, approach. And you can see that the intervals either don't compute anything or usually something that's actually a big over approximation. Yeah. Um, on these examples, how many floating point values are typically in the valid input ranges uh, for a like lot. for single precision? Um, these were all so we usually did the experiments with double okay. precision, so it wouldn't be enough to actually try all of them. Okay. And not in a reasonable amount of time, because you would have to run a higher precision computation side by side, and for these experiments we usually let it run overnight anyway. 
Oh, and we compare here against intervals, but because these are nonlinear, affine arithmetic sometimes even performs worse than just plain uh, interval arithmetic. Okay, so now that we have the ranges, we can compute the errors. So for this, I'll introduce some notation. So the f is going to be the mathematical function that we're trying to compute. The f tilde is going to be the finite precision one. And similarly, the simple x is the ideal x without any errors, and x tilde is with errors. So we could try to just compute this error as is, but instead we found this was not quite as good as we hoped. We actually separate these errors into the propagation of the initial errors. So you have the f just with different inputs. And then the second one is the same inputs, but the difference between the f and f tilde. So this is essentially the new round of errors that are committed. And we actually use different techniques for this because the propagation of initial errors is essentially a real-valued property. Even if you could compute over real values and you had errors, they would still be potentially magnified by your computation. Whereas the round of errors are really just a finite precision artifact. So let's start with the round of errors. So we want to track the round of errors through a computation. So we essentially step through the computation. At every step, we want to know how big is the round of and track it through the rest. So we use a fine arithmetic for this, and it's, if you expand the sum, each summand of that is essentially one round of that has been committed at one point of the iteration. Now when you commit an error, you still have to propagate it through the rest, and for this we just use the standard rules of a fine arithmetic. And the new errors are just appended to the sum. Now computation of this new round of er error is the only place where our computation differs for the different finite precision data types. So if you come up with your new non-standard floating point unit, you just need to tell me how to compute this round of error here, and then the rest will still follow. Any questions so far? So for the error propagation, as I said, this is a real valued property. So we just have the normal f, just with different inputs. And if you're a mathematician, this is fairly simple. This just screams uh, Lipschitz continuity. So we bound this error essentially by a linear approximation. We compute the derivative of the function. And the intuition is the steeper the function is, the bigger your input errors will be magnified. Um, now we want to compute the worst case. So we have to take the worst case uh, derivative that you could have over your input domain. And we want to compute this fully automatically. So we actually compute these partial derivatives symbolically, which we can do because we have standard arithmetic. And then we use the Z3-based procedure that I presented before, which is fully automated but captures enough of the correlations in the derivative so that we can bound this fairly accurately. So actually here the Z3 solver was quite crucial. Just interval arithmetic would not have been enough. Now you may ask, I talked now about twice error propagation. We can do error propagation with, uh, with affine arithmetic and we can do it with uh, Lipschitz continuity. So why not just use affine arithmetic? It seems simpler. So we actually started with that, but the errors were a little bit bigger than we hoped. So the over approximation was large. So we now do a two-step procedure. So we first compute the round of errors on T in that, in this um, expression with affine arithmetic. And then the round of errors on T here become the initial errors for the expression T2. And those then we propagate uh, with the derivative-based procedure. And we do this for every expression that is defined as such in the program. Now the reason we do this is because affine arithmetic is good when the errors that you're tracking are very small, something like round of errors. However, when these become bigger, the over approximations that you commit also tend to grow very much. Now, derivatives are m more useful when you can look at the entire computation and just compute the der derivative for the entire one, because some things may cancel. And because we look at the whole thing, then we can actually see these correlations. And with Z3, we can take them into account as well. I used to have questions for this. So. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, uh... The, so T2 is the error from the derivative like of T? 
so this would be 2t plus times the error. Yeah, so sorry, so t. what are the, the t terms are error terms? This is just a program. This is just a program. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. So, okay. But so you only no... want to use the affine arithmetic for short portions of the program. Got it. I was and we just split this well at the let statements that the user defines. Okay. Now we could do this fully automatically, refactor the program. For now, we don't do it because the user tends to write these anyway in this fashion. Okay, so we are not the first and also not the only ones trying to compute round of errors and bounties. So there's a tool called Fluctuat, uh, which was also used in some setting within Airbus. It's not quite known exactly what they did. Um, so this was developed more, more or less concurrently and was also a fine arithmetic based. And they also found that just a fine arithmetic is not quite good enough. So they tried the retrofitting route uh, with adding constraints to these um, affine terms, but they also included interval subdivision to deal with the over approximations. Now FP Tyler came last year and they take a completely different approach. So they take a Tyler approximation with respect to the errors in some big constraint and then formulate the problem as an optimization problem. Um, because they don't quite rely just on a Z3 solver, they can also handle transcendentals. And they do generate some certificates, but I was told by my student that it takes over two hours to check these. And real to float is another um, tool that takes the same approach as FP Taylor, just uses a different optimization procedure at the end. So obviously we have to compare the numbers that we get on our benchmarks, and I've done this. I will not actually go through these um, graphs <coughs> with you. So before I had tables, but they're not very informative either. The trouble with these benchmarks is that the numbers that we compute, the kind of round of errors, they heavily depend on the kind of inputs that we specify. And at this point, these are more or less randomly chosen. So I'll just give you the gist. In general, for straight line codes, so the kind of size of uh, benchmarks I've shown you before, the differences between these three tools are very much the same. Um, the runtimes are very, also very similar. It's mostly on the order of seconds. Um, however, just having an exact comparison makes little sense because they have been implemented in three different programming languages. But the gist is the differences are small. What is not quite the same is sort of the what I call asymptotic limitation. So there are certain um, well, all of the tools have some bottleneck somewhere, and these tend to be different. So if you really wanted to use these kind of techniques, say, in industry, ideally you would combine all three techniques together. So for us, the bottleneck is really the SMT solver, which may time out at some point. Um, Fluctuat has, in general, is very fast and has predictable times, but the accuracy may deteriorate um, when the programs become bigger. And FP Tyler has potentially very large running times when you add these additional constraints to the program. So I guess for short programs, I would consider this a solved problem at this point. So then usually the question comes, so far we had straight line code, what about discontinuities? What about branches? So suppose you had some very complicated expression and you decided you want to approximate these, and you ran this through Mathematica, and Mathematica would generate something like this. So it decided to split your domain into two and give you two different simpler expressions. Now, what the expressions look like is not really important here. Important is that you now have two branches. And since we have a real-valued uh, specification language, when we compute errors, we have to <coughs> consider the case where the real valued computation, say, would take the if branch, but because you have some input errors, the finite precision one would take the other. So what's the difference? So let's suppose, consider just a very simple if then else, so we can also handle nested uh, statements, but let's stick to that. So now we have F1, so that'll be the if branch that we consider that is taken by the real valued computation and then the finite precision one takes the else branch. So we do the same trick with the separation of errors as before, but now into three pieces. 
So the first piece essentially captures the fact that we may have some initial error, and this will be also magnified by the real valued computation if it takes the if branch. The second piece captures the real value difference between the branches. And the third one is the round of error that would be committed by the finite precision computation in the, uh, in the else branch. And we actually already have all the tools to compute all of these three. So this is the derivative-based uh, one. This one we can bound just with the Z3-based uh, interval arithmetic. And the round of errors are captured by the affine arithmetic. Now, initially, we tried to generate a huge constraint that essentially just captured this piece and fed this into Z3 and tried to bound it, but that just did not scale at all. So the trick was here to do the separation in the fashion so that we can actually capture all of these. Now, you do add some over approximation, but at least you make it possible to compute each piece separately. So I have these tables again. These are a little bit easier to read. So right now, it's just two tools. And it's mostly easier to read because um, Fluctuat doesn't really scale well when you have these really complicated constraints. So the, on the errors, the scale is log scale. So we're significantly better uh, on this. And FP Taylor doesn't actually have uh, any procedure for capturing uh, discontinuity errors. Now, the flip side comes when you look at the analysis time. So Fluctuat is constantly done in one second. For us, it may take a bit longer because we rely on Z3 on the back end. But it's still on the order of seconds mostly, except for the jet, up, jet engine approximation. And that one has been haunting us from the beginning. <coughs> OK, then the next question is always, so what about loops? So the trouble with loops is that when you have numerical errors, such as round of errors, they usually grow with every iteration without a fixed bound. So we can't really try to find a fixed point. We could try to unroll, but especially the Z3-based procedure doesn't scale beyond two or three iterations. Um, so our strategy, after looking at the kind of equations we had before, was that for certain kinds of loops, we can actually express the error as a function of the number of iterations. So this sounds very good, because then we have a function, and we can just plug in some numbers for n. So to explain how this works, I'll introduce a little bit more notation. So now the <coughs> uh, procedure for propagating errors, the derivative based, I'll just call that the function g. And the sigma will be just a function that computes round of errors. So, and what we're interested in is iterating some arithmetic expression m times. Now, we don't consider the case where the real valued and the finite precision one could take different numbers of iterations. So, you, you just have some integer counter that controls the number of iterations. Then we just want the difference of that. So, if you do some algebra on a piece of paper, you can come up with this expression, uh, which you don't really need to understand. But it essentially captures that. You, com you have some initial round of error, and you track it through the m iterations of your program. And you, at some iteration, you commit some round of error, and you track it through the rest of the iterations that you have. That's all it's, this captures. So this is yet not very useful, because the g and the sigma could compute different numbers for different iterations. So this would really just amount to loop unrolling, and not, not much more. However, if we could compute just a fixed g and a fixed sigma, then the whole thing just um, simplifies to a simple function, which is then a function on, in the number of iterations. So the k are the derivatives that we have computed before, and the sigma is a constant uh, which captures the maximum round off in our loop. And then this is just a function of this m. So this works. For instance, for an application like this, which is a simulation of a pendulum. And the assumption that we make is that the ranges of the variables that we iterate over are bounded. You remember for the computation of round of errors and also um, for the propagation, we always require these input ranges. And this is essentially the, if these are bounded, we can then just do the computation for the loop body once and for all. 
So we can analyze the derivatives once for the loop body, compute the new round of error once, and then we just can plug these numbers into the closed form expression. So and this actually scales for this benchmark up to 500 and probably even more, we just didn't compute it. Uh, iterations. Fluctuart, which has to do unrolling in this case, uh, scales to about 50 iterations and then the techniques become too inaccurate and just computes infinity. Um, as I mentioned before, our normal procedure, if you try to unroll, it doesn't scale even to three iterations. And the times here are constant, more or less, for all of these because we just compute this expression once. Okay, so that summarizes this part of the talk. So there were some challenges that we faced that wasn't quite obvious from the beginning. And really the key <coughs> ideas that made all of this work was the separation of errors into different parts and choosing different methods to compute them. And in the end, the methods were combinations of very standard techniques like interval and affine arithmetic together with advances in SMT. Any questions so far? Very good. Everyone impressed. So one thing that we relied on in all of the previous work was that the computation that the user wrote was executed in exactly the same order on your machine. Because finite precision uh, arithmetic is non-associative, if you change the order, you'll change the numbers and also the errors um, that you commit. So for instance, if you take an expression like this, so this is a, um, an embedded controller, which should be implemented in fixed point arithmetic. Now if we do a simulation, we can find out that we will have a worst case round of error of this, uh, this magnitude. Now if we just change the order in which we compute the, the sum, we could more than double the error. Now this is the pessimistic view. The optimistic view is that we want to go the other way and actually improve round of errors just by changing the order of the computation. Now one thing to note, in this case, for those who know what catastrophic cancellation is, I'll just explain that in a second, we don't actually try to fix catastrophic cancellations. So actually in all of our benchmarks, we didn't have any of this case. So catastrophic cancellation happens when you try to subtract two finite precision numbers that have some noise that are very close in magnitude because then you essentially subtract out all the significant digits and you're just left with noise. So this is like the really bad case. But even if you don't have this bad case, you can change the order and actually improve errors by over 50%. And the motivation for this work was, as I said, this is an embedded system controller. The uh, stability of the controller is proportional to the, well, inversely proportional to your round of errors. So if you can reduce your round of errors, you can make your controller <coughs> more stable. So this was joint work with uh, Indra Nil Saha and Rupak Majundar. And, and this is purely changing the order. You're not changing the actual operations. Group. Yeah, we're just changing the order. So if you want to change the order, you can't, well, if you want to find the expression that has the smallest error, you quickly find that you can't just enumerate all the possible orders because there's too many of them. Um, it also doesn't work to do something like dynamic, um, well, so you, even if you try to locally optimize uh, the errors, when you propagate that through your computation, you may end up with a very large error uh, globally. So we chose genetic programming as our search strategy. So we start off with the same expression in 30 copies. And then in every iteration, we apply mutation operations, just the standard mathematical uh, identities like associativity or distributivity. And we also use some version of crossover, although that, that, that was just mildly helpful here. Now what's sort of different is that we actually use the static analysis as the fitness function. So the smaller the error, the better the function, so the better the, the fitness of an expression. And that's really guiding the, um, uh, the search. Is, is this really just uh, genetic programming? It seems like uh, some simple heuristics could greatly improve it. The trouble is that the order of the computation heavily depends on the kind of numbers that you allow. So if, if you have some order that's very good, 
and you just change the domain of one of your inputs, that may completely change the order. That would be better. And this is very non-obvious. So for certain cases, you can say, OK, especially when there is a catastrophic cancellation, um, you can show this to some programmer and say, OK, here is your problem. But if you don't really have something really bad happening, it's very non-obvious. There was more questions, yeah. Why can't this fix catastrophic cancellations? Oh, it could, but oh, okay. uh, didn't. It, we just, it, it wasn't the target, really. OK. Now, the static analysis obviously is going to tell you when something bad is happening, because the error is just going to be huge. Uh, but we don't specifically then try to fix it. So unlike Herbie, we don't do like a, a localization or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, like in Herbie, right, instead of doing static analysis, we do simulation, yep. um, which is really important for making the search fast. Do you think if, if you do use simulation instead of analysis just during search, that it would, like, do you, do you think that would change the results or? So I don't have the numbers here. Actually, I had a student do a comparison between static analysis, very various different static analyses and dynamic analyses. Um, so we found now in Scala on a JVM, obviously it's not quite the same as in C or Racket. Um, we found that a dynamic analysis with a reasonable, reasonably small number of inputs performed pretty much the same as a static analysis. Now, performed the same, I mean, the test we did, we <coughs> computed the fitness on a number of rewritings and then took the Cartesian product and always checked, given two expressions, is the fitness function able to determine which one is better? Now, the reason why we do this is something I wanted to talk about here. Now, when, we, when you use a static analysis as a function, now the same also applies for the dynamic analysis. Um, you want to know whether, when you use this function to determine whether one expression is better or the other, whether the true error is actually, uh, so whether one is truly better than the other, or whether this is just given uh, by the over approximation that the static analysis does. Because the analysis does some over approximation, and it could be that it just does more over approximation for one expression and a little bit less for the other. So we did this, evaluated this empirically on the fixed point arithmetic. So here, this was for a linear benchmark. Um, the simulated um, errors are with the symbol. So this is with some 1 million inputs. So this is relatively close to the true error. And the box gives you the, uh, an error that was analyzed. Now, as you can see, there is a very clear correspondence uh, between the two. So this means when our analysis says expression 1 is better, the true error of that expression is actually smaller. But this is just one function, right? Yes. So we ran this on several uh, benchmarks. And the picture for linear expressions was always the same. Now, if you have nonlinear expressions, the correspondence becomes a little bit more unclear. So there are still some correlations, but it's not quite as clear. Now, if you use a dynamic analysis instead of a static analysis, the pictures look more or less the same. Because in that case, you don't do an over approximation, but an under approximation, but the same kind of, yeah, yeah. you have the same problem. Now, for us, it's worked anyway, because in our setting, we had some embedded system which, over which you want to prove something. So you're happy if you can prove some better bound for one expression, even though the true error uh, may be a little bit higher. So this talks about the guarantees that we can provide, which are actually not many. So the round of error that we do compute for the final expression that we generate is sound. However, we cannot guarantee any kind of optimality of the, of the search. Search is obviously incomplete. And we have these um, over or under approximations that may not discriminate expressions correctly. So just some in intuition or argument why the search actually works. So this tracks the errors of our population of expressions um, through the generations of the genetic algorithm. And as you can see, they sort of converge to some smaller error. 
And we did this across some benchmarks and you always have the same kind of picture. So some actual end-to-end -end numbers. Um, we had some benchmarks that were generated by MATLAB Simulink for control systems. So this is something that an engineer would actually do. Um, and that generated expression was our baseline. And when we ran our genetic search over it, then we could improve the round of errors sometimes up to 70, 75%. And as I said, this directly uh, translates into better stability of the controller. Um, so this, these experiments were done in fixed point arithmetic. Now the same actually holds for floating point arithmetic as well. And I had a student implement the search in a successor to Rosa. So these are the re results there. These benchmarks are the linear benchmarks. These ones here are nonlinear. As you see, the results are a little bit worse, a little bit lower. But you still have improvements in most cases. So sometimes, so here the um, dark red uh, bars are the static error improvements, and the light ones are the actual error improvements. So you can see that for some, we actually make the expression worse. But the static analysis can still compute a smaller error. Depends on your application. This may, may be good enough, wanted. But these are just preliminary results so far. Yes? Um, do you have any intuition for the performance impact of reducing the rounding error um, with, with this genetic approach? Well, you may potentially increase the number of operations. Um, so then that would potentially make your uh, program faster. Uh, slower. Um, we have not really measured that. The other thing is measuring performance or predicting performance of floating point computation is very hard. Actually, I tried to talk to people in the worst case execution time community, and as soon as you say floating point, <laughs> that's it. Yes? So the mutation you used were changing the distribution and associated with it. Yep. Uh, what uh, would you need to change to do more mutations, perhaps even randomly changing the program? Could you detect that the random program would compute something totally different? Potentially you could. There is actually some work um, by Alex Eikens, PhD student. Mm -hmm. um, the trouble then, there is the verification part. Because so far, we've always kept the expression semantically equivalent, so we didn't actually have to worry about that difference. Whereas when you change the semantics, you have to capture that difference in your verification as well. Now, they use the dynamic testing procedure, which you can obviously do. But on the static side, it becomes more and more difficult. Um, perhaps you could do some of the, perhaps you could retrofit the uh, procedure we had for the discontinuity error in that case as well because you could imagine it's like two branches and you just take the difference of that. But the procedure relied on the SMT solver and that was rather expensive. So the search is going to take a long time. A quick question about yep. these errors. These are over the entire range? Yes. Or some, so this could be more pessimistic than it is? So in general, I think our errors are, except for this jet engine benchmark, they were mostly within an order of magnitude of the true errors. Well, which is actually fairly good, I think. Yes? So I was going to say, um, are your semantically equivalent altered programs also, um, do, do they have the same performance characteristics as the original program? Does it, do, you, do you cause? performance problems or get performance videos by re-airing the operations, or is that usually the same? Well, we could increase the number of operations that you perform. So that could increase the, the runtime. But here the motivation was really reduce the round of error because, I was, I was, I was just yeah, no, it, that, that could happen, yes. But as I said, actually checking the performance is very hard, too. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. For what it's worth, I think in our experience, you know, you occasionally get, you actually make things faster by doing like Taylor series expansions, which is another mutation that yeah. would, I think that your analysis would totally be fine with, I think, right? But you would probably need to use the SMT solver for Yeah, that. so that's gonna make the search more expensive. Yeah. Um, but then sometimes like if you're trying to eliminate a catastrophic cancellation, 
you do tricks that introduce more operations, and you can make things like three x slower sometimes, which is a bummer. But so there's some there's some tension there, but it's just hard. Yeah. Okay, we're again not the only one, so you already heard about Herbie. Um, some people tried to use a abstract interpretation sort of approach, which really amounted to something like a greedy search. Um, and there's also a possibility to formulate this rewriting problem as an SMT synthesis problem, but that only works for linear expressions due to the limitation on the, on the theories. Unfortunately, there's no comparison so far, really, between the techniques. OK, so that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I hope I convinced you that quantifying numerical uncertainties is actually hard. Um, and for us, what really worked was this combination of techniques with uh, SMT. Thank you. Yes. Can you give us some insights on what tricks human provers use that you are not using yet? and that they could incorporate them? Tricks in the verification oh, or? <coughs> well, as I said at the very beginning, my impression from numerical analysis is that most of the bounds are asymptotic. So it's, in this case, you could say, okay, the, the errors are going to grow with the number of iteration by an exponential or something like this, but not really the kind of tight bounds that you need for even compiling these fixed point codes. Um, so if at some point when learning about fixed points, I did some of these compilations by hand, and you essentially replicate this analysis yourself. But it's very tedious. Russ, I would say that the, the interesting cases for manual verification are those that involve loops and branches, where you're pulling in your additional model of how the loop no additional loop structure that you have to use. Yeah, so actually for the loops, I said we rely on these ranges to be bounded, but we can't actually prove that at this point. So for instance, for this pendulum, you would have to find a loop invariant that would have to talk about the energy of the system. So I actually tried this, but it seems that just because of these round of errors, it's incredibly hard uh, to prove. Because the ranges stay bounded, but there is a slight shift that you would need to capture in that loop invariant, and at least I haven't figured out how to do that. Um, have you looked at applying the, sorry, could you go back to the uh, benchmarks from the Rosa++ tool? Which ones, this one? Yeah, so are, do these have loops? No, no, these are all straight on code. Okay. Um, have you looked at all at like, inter so, so it's, it, 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 Another thing I was wondering if you looked at, another thing human experts do is they sometimes introduce compensating terms. So like they know some expression that is approximately what the error of like some previous operation is, and they can add it back in, like consummation and loops. Yeah. Have you guys looked at like introducing additional uh, variables with compensating terms to like correct things, or I'm just curious. Um, not really. Um, I guess you could improve some of these error bounds by doing this, but then potentially you would actually make it very much lower. Yeah, so that, we played with this a little bit with Herbie Loops. Um, it was sort of shocking like how well it worked in the loop context, um, but I guess we, we haven't really found a lot of straight line uses for it yet, and it does make a huge performance difference. And the thing is with the kind of uh, abstractions that we use for the static analysis, I'm not sure we can actually prove that they're yeah, better. An analyzing Cajon summation is really hard. Yeah. Because of the way it gets carried across iterations, uh, you need to know a lot more about floating points than what we do. So we just use this one plus delta abstraction, and mm -hmm. I doubt it that that captures it. It's it's not only do you have correlations between variables, but you have a correlation between one variable and, and the error previous. and the error on a different variable. Yeah. So this is hard to track. A question. Uh, yep. Do you know why the jet engine approximation uh, problem is particularly troublesome? So you have two input variables but the expressions is very long and you have a lot of correlations between the variables. Okay, but I use the SMT solver as a black box, so this is just a hunch. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Do I pick? Yeah. All right. So Go. It seems, it seems like you fall back on genetic algorithms as a sort of like like a, a fallback in a case where you have a space that's too big to search or enumerate, and you don't have a good way of sort of rephrasing your your question or defining a, a structure to search over yeah. that you can easily feed to an SMT solver. So it. So there, there is no way to like phrase this in a nice way that we have a, a, a tool to simplify the search? Or at least we haven't found one, yes. Okay. So it's the yeah. impression is right. We tried to find some structured way of searching, and we couldn't okay. find it. Okay. And so then my other question is, if this really is, if, if, if that's fundamental, right, if, if, if there's no way to ever search this space, have you tried looking at any other like deep learning techniques to try to, well, like, I mean, genetic programming is great, but we're not sharing anything across multiple instances. So. I'm not sure there is anything to share. So as I mentioned before, if you just change the domain of one input variable, yeah. you may completely change what's the optimal expression. Okay. So I'm not sure there's really anything to share. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 at least the way I, I see things, the idea of, of, of deep learning is you try it, and maybe there is something to share that's not obvious, and it will find it for you. But, um, sure. Anyway, just. Well, I mean, also the genetic search, it was easy to implement, and it actually worked. So for we did also some tests for smaller benchmarks where we could actually enumerate all of the rewritings, and then the genetic search would always find the best one for, yeah, on the sure, small which, ones. Which kind of makes sense, because if the search is small enough that you can enumerate, then it's... Well, but the like genetic search did not actually enumerate all of them. Okay, it didn't cover it, but it, it hit the points that were addressed yes. quickly. Okay. That's, that's, that's encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So at the first part of the talk, you mentioned that there are different tools, and each of them have like different strengths and weakness. And if you want to apply in like in serial work like code base, you would basically combine these techniques together. So is is it as simple as you just like run them all in parallel and see which one gives you like the result, or does it require more work to actually combine these techniques together? Um, well, there's two parts of that. If you just have some fairly short expression, you could just run it in parallel and just take the smallest error that it gives you. If you want to scale this up, you probably need to do some more work because none of these tools really scales beyond short expressions at this point. So just like for the, the actual code that we analyze, also for the static analysis, you have a trade-off between accuracy and performance. So if you want to scale up in some reasonable time to bigger expressions, you'll have to give up somewhere on the accuracy. So far, we don't really know yet how. One last question. So, so maybe a, a little bit um, different angle. Uh, so I know that in the old days, when people got CS degrees, especially PhDs, they like, had to study numerical analysis. But now like, a lot of departments don't even have a numerical analysis class or anybody who could teach it. So like, what are we going to do in the future? Should we start using these things in our classes? Or will it just be the case they get so good that people will know to use them? Or like, like, how do we get the word out? How do we proselytize? So I don't view this as numerical analysis. So I do use partial derivatives, which for certain reviewers is very, very advanced. But this is really not numerical analysis. So maybe it should, as phrase the question. This is really an implementation issue. Like programmers need to use floating point, but they have no training in any way to think about floating point. So we're trying to build tools to help them deal with floating point. Uh, like, should we teach with these? Like, will they just like will they just start be, being integrated in IDEs or like? like I mean, where, when will this sh like how will, when will this show up in the regular programmer's toolbox? Well, you have to teach programmers something like what is catastrophic cancellation, and if you know that it's happening, how to fix it. I think that can be done. However, realizing that it's happening, that you will need a tool for. Because, I mean, the program is going to generate different numbers, but you may not know that these are actually wrong. So for, for that, we would need a tool. Now, for something like rearranging <coughs> a computation where there is not obviously something wrong with it, I don't see how people actually can do that themselves. So for that, you definitely need tools. Thank you very much, Evan.